All right, Matthew chapter 21 is where we're going to spend our time this morning uh, as we deliver this message uh, heading into our time of preaching and teaching and certainly my hope for us is that we will continue to sit with the magnanimity of the story of Jesus as Jesus makes his final journey to Jerusalem. Uh, there were, and there continues to be, a whole series of passages that our lectionary highlights for us. And um, I, I'm going to spend my time in Matthew, but I was certainly captivated by uh, one of the passages that came up in the the readings for the litur the liturgy of the Passion as well. On the Sunday before Resurrection Sunday or Easter, often uh, you have multiple passages to read through or to think about in this particular way. It is Palm Sunday, uh, but there also are passages related to uh, what is called Passion Sunday as well. The the Sunday where it is certainly acknowledged for those who would not make it to a Good Friday service, uh, the reality that Jesus had to make a trip to Jerusalem on his way to the cross. That in as much as Easter represents the highest culminating holy day of our tradition, uh, you can't get to Resurrection Sunday without going through the cross. And, you know, uh, I, as I was reading, particularly in Isaiah chapter number 50, I'm not going to preach from this passage, but I am going to weave it in as a way to help us appreciate that um, Jesus knew that in order to get to victory, he had to go through trial. And that is a very counterintuitive sensibility. I mean, many of us, if we were honest, would rather skip trial and just go straight to victory. <laughs> it's like, what's, why, why I got the fool around with this struggle part? Amen. Uh, it has been March Madness, and it has been fascinating watching all of the college teams, at least 68 of them, I think, you know, started out, it used to be 64, back in the day, I think it was 32, and they just keep growing the field. But you have folk who are literally starting out at the beginning of the year with everyone hoping to make it to March Madness. And depending on how well you do throughout the year, you end up in the final 64. Everyone goes into March Madness with a ranking. Four brackets of 16 teams that are literally ranked according to what a competition committee would describe as their uh, level of accomplishment in the quote-unquote regular season. Now, what's, what's so interesting about this is most folk who are ranked number one are usually favored to be the final two teams standing. And this is one of the years where literally not one number one team made it even to the last four teams standing. Not one number two team. Not one number three team. I think the highest ranking seeds were numbers four and five and 13. And, and one could argue that if you came into the tournament ranked number 13 and you still standing as one of the last four teams, you probably feel like I've had a great season. But what's so interesting, I was watching the games last night, 
when the number 13 team lost at the buzzer, they were devastated. They didn't appreciate that, you know, we probably shouldn't be here <laughs> to begin with. We just, you know, overperformed. But how many know when you have a goal in mind, the journey often heightens your expectations. It is not as much as where you start in the journey, but the closer you get to your goal, how many of you know that you start to want it more and more and more? Well, I want you to think about Jesus, who the scriptures say in another part of the text, the sacred text that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Meaning that Jesus, while not fully understanding, one could argue, at his birth, what the totality of his purpose was meant to be. Because I want to believe that at the age of four, five, six, seven, eight, Jesus probably was not fully conscious that you know, I'm going to end up dying for the sins of all creation. I'm sure Jesus was, you know, just like one, our, our little young, happy, <laughs> joyful fella that running around, or your joyful fellas and girls and Loved ones that just run around. You know, when you're a kid, you don't fully understand what life is all about. You're not supposed to. You're a kid. But the older you get, you start to realize, man, there's some things at stake in my life that I can't just trivialize. How many have lived life long enough and gone through enough things where you realize, I just can't trivialize life anymore? There were easy answers to hard questions that I used to feel like, okay, well, you know, I'll just internalize that and just keep it moving. But the older you get, you start to realize, you know, those nicely boxed answers don't really provide as much satisfaction as they used to. Jesus at, one would argue, his early 30s, people call it the Jesus year, 33. I don't know if he was really 33, but we call it that. How many know Jesus at 33 was probably very different than Jesus at the age of five? Jesus at the age of 33 was probably very different than Jesus at the age of 12. Jesus at the age of 33, Jesus at the end of his life was probably much more clearer about his journey than he was when he first got started. And it's worth saying that in the biblical text, we only have three years recorded of Jesus' ministry. So Jesus lived this whole life coming into full appreciation of his authentic self. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years of his life, he was living out his authentic purpose. What would you do if you knew you only had a few more days to live out your authentic purpose? It's one thing, you know, to feel like you got unlimited time. That is the gift of youth, right? Oh, you know, <laughs> I got time. Time is on my side. <laughs> But when you get a little older, remember we were marching in Ferguson, and the young people would be marching, and you know, I was a little younger back then. Had a little more energy. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 dopamine had more influence in my life, and you know. Uh, I could get high off of adrenaline and just push my body, praise God. And young people would be marching. We'd be getting tear gassed and chased off by state troopers with rifles. And I joined the young people saying, we young, we strong. 
we marching all night long. And that's what he said. We, we young. We strong. We marching all night long. And we would do it. We young. They tear gases. We strong. You know, we get louder. We just defiant. Now I'm like, I'm not young. I'm not strong. And I'm not marching. I'm not doing that no more. Somebody say amen. How many can say that there's moments in your life where you start realizing what I used to do as a younger person? I'm not saying I'm old, but I'm not as young as I used to be. And God bless all you young folk who's still there. You'd be like, oh, what is Pastor talking about? I'm still young. I'm still strong. I'm still doing all kind of things all night long. Praise God. Some of us is like, it's 9 o'clock. It's time to go to bed. Praise God. It's, life, life, life is short. Praise God. I got to get my eight hours. I got to sleep a third of my golden years away. Mm -hmm. But Jesus knew that he only had a few years to make an eternal impact. And here in this story, Jesus is conscious. I refer to this passage in the prophets that helps to clarify some of this verse number Isaiah chapter 50. I'm not going to come from there, but Isaiah chapter 50 uh, verse number seven, the scripture says that it is the Lord who helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, and I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be put to shame. And it can be said that towards the end of Jesus' life, he knew that everything he had done up until this moment was for these last few days. That setting his face towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, like a flint. Some of you may not understand what that means, because that's good old, you know, King James biblical language. But it is like a stone, like I am moving in a direction where I will not be detoured. And it <clears throat> creates a backdrop that I think is important for our text in Matthew today, because Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, though it begins with him being welcomed with palms, Jesus was conscious that it would end with him ending up in a trial. And I wonder, as we enter into Holy Week, is there an opportunity for you and I to not romanticize how hard it must have been for Jesus to enter into the final days of his life, knowing that the celebrations would soon turn to condemnation, and yet he still had to remain authentically who he was created to be. It may be instructive for some of us who are trying to navigate our journey and appreciate that Jesus done been down the road. You may have all may may our journeying today or may have to journey in the future. Matthew chapter 21, verse number one. Now I, I have two versions here, but I think I'm gonna I'm go to the to the more uh, new Revised Standard Version or the NIV. I don't know which one they'll put on the screen, but <clears throat> you can certainly follow along or follow along in your own particular uh, device or Bible if you still have one of those things called a book. Praise God. <laughs> Matthew chapter 21, verse number one, the scripture says like this, and when they, talking about the disciples, certainly along with Jesus, had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. Everybody say two disciples. 
saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them. Everybody say that. The Lord needs them. Pat yourself on the chest and say, the Lord needs me. Or them. <laughs> Praise God. And he will send them immediately. We ought not, you know, uh, underappreciate how uh, much faith it took for these disciples to show up to a random person's house and tell someone they do not know, the Lord needs your donkey. Be tantamount to someone showing up to your house. Say, hey, can I get the keys to your car? Be like, what? And your response is, the Lord needs it. I don't know what your response would be, but in the age of calling the police on anybody, some of you would probably be calling 911. Mm -hmm. And so the scripture continues to say, Verse number four, this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse number six, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd, everybody say large crowd, spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road and the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Verse 10, and when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. We'll keep on reading verse number 12. And then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that Jesus did and heard the children crying out of the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to Jesus, do you hear what they are saying? Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? And Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So uh, I want to just ask the provocative question. This message, uh, I want to invite you to think about holy authenticity holy authenticity. Bless the word of God for us, the people of God, and we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the readers, hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Now, Matthew is one of the four Gospels written 
less than one full generation after the death of Jesus, which just means that when these gospel accounts came out, there were still people who were alive who had the ability to dispute and or verify what had been captured. It is tantamount to, uh, you know, my father or others who lived through the time of Martin Luther King Jr. And it'd be one thing for me to write about Martin Luther King Jr. because I was not alive when he was alive. I've heard things about Martin Luther King Jr., but there were people who were alive during the time of Martin Luther King Jr. who actually saw him, who actually hung out with him, who could literally retell their memories and stories so as to ensure that there was an authentic, proximal account, not a bunch of he say, she say hearsay type stuff. Now, there are other, you know, he say, she say narratives that perhaps one could inject in the story of a Martin Luther King jury as well as a story of Jesus. But it is worth saying that these gospels capture very similar accounts of similar or same events with a particular audience in mind. Matthew was written to a people who had a deep and very clear historical framework of what it meant to be a Jew, a Hebrew, an Israelite, someone who was a part of a millennia worth of stories that were foretelling of the coming of a Messiah. Jesus' story as it would be told by Matthew, would continue throughout more than other gospel accounts to pull language from the prophets and from the Jewish sacred text so the readers and the hearers of Matthew's gospel could make some connections that Jesus was not just some untethered historical figure making claims. But when they would read the Gospel of Matthew, they would read the story of Jesus and see that Jesus is actually fulfilling a promise that had been made to a people thousands of years before they came onto the scene. For the reader of Matthew, they would hear Jesus being described in certain ways and go back in their Jewish Sunday school days, if you will. Be like, hmm, that sounds like the Messiah we've been told about when I was a little young person. Or that sounds like the, the great liberator, the one who would restore the promises and hopes of my ancestors. And, and, and perhaps I am now living in the time when prophecy is actually coming to fruition. I want you to think a little bit about the significance of a promise being fulfilled in your lifetime. I want you to think about how would you feel or how do you feel when God answers a prayer you prayed for a while. I mean, don't it make you feel like, man, I think I'm gonna keep on praying. <laughs> don't it make you feel like I'm gonna keep on believing? I mean, have you ever gotten a little bit of a big prayer that you've prayed? You prayed for something magnanimous and you got the down payment on <laughs> God, I prayed for a million dollars and somehow I got a thousand. All right, God, well, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to thank you for this thousand. I'm going to keep on praying. You pray for your children to 
move in a certain direction and they just took one step and you're like, God, I say thank you. I'm going to keep on praying. You asked to be the CEO and you just got a little promotion. You're like, okay, God, I'll start with whatever. You ask God for straight A's and you, you know, passed your test. You're like, thank you, Jesus. How many know a little bit of fulfillment can light a fire in your expectation? I don't mean to get too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Lost in my thoughts. But I was captivated by this, uh, this uh, crater that is somewhere in the former Soviet Union, as it was somewhere over there in the region that is called or named Russia. And in the 60s, they say that they were digging for oil. And they struck a hole in the ground, and within a day, the hole literally just caught on fire. And it is turned into this crater that they now call the doorway to hell. Because it has had gases that have continued to burn since 1961. And a little bit of hole has turned into a crater and they can't put the fire out. And I almost got stuck in that crater last night or the, this week when I was reading it because it made me think of how easy it could be when God lights a little bit of expectation in the heart of a believer. You digging for something and you don't even know that you may not need all of it, but just a little bit helps to ignite more faith more expectation, more imagination. And the writer of the Gospel of Matthew is attempting to help the children of Israel appreciate that yes, this Jesus who has literally disrupted everything is the fire, the match that is meant to ignite your expectation. That Away from your eyes, God has always been moving. I want you to think about this fact while we see the calamity in the land. Certainly the Jewish audience listening to the account of Matthew have in their background Roman imperialism. They have in their mindset that, man, I'm constantly being jacked by the police or these soldiers. I am constantly being cheated by the economic system of my day. I am living in a foreign land. And yet Jesus shows up for three years and totally disrupts the normativity of their experience. They only experienced Jesus for three years. Jesus had been here for well over 30. God was moving in their worst conditions and they did not know it. I don't know if this is helpful for you in a moment where Worse conditions seem to be more palpable than our best aspirations. You know, yesterday, I think there were two earthquakes in the span of 30 minutes. At least here in the Bay Area, there was one in San Diego. We had hurricanes, tornadoes touching down all over the country. We've had floods, we've had fires, we got presidents, so at least one. On his way to jail. Somebody say hallelujah or I'm praying for him on his way. <laughs> Calamity. Isn't it interesting that 
as trouble emerges, sometimes we can forget that God is still at work among us. God is at work in your life, in your story. And what this passage teaches us is that there will be moments in your life where you will get surprised by the appearance of the God who has been at work in your story your whole life. Jesus shows up on a timeline that only he knew. <clears throat> and yet when he shows up, he shows up in a way that ignites expectation from those who were not looking for Jesus on that day, but Jesus' arrival ignited something in them that one could argue have been looking for Jesus long before Jesus showed up. You and I must fully appreciate that Jesus is always wanting to show up in your life. And Jesus shows up unannounced more than he does announced. Jesus shows up at the owners of this donkey and cold unannounced. But these owners become a part of Jesus' story eternally. Their story is told annually as an example for us to follow that if God says God has need of you, your answer every time ought to be yes. You and I are a people who are often ill-prepared when Jesus shows up because Jesus often shows up in the way we least expect, and listen to this, Jesus often shows up in the way we don't want to be saved. <laughs> Jesus' disciples, who are clear about how liberation should come to their people, even now are likely saying, all right, Jesus is finally getting ready to turn up. He's saying, let's go get a colt, a donkey, and let's make our procession into Jerusalem. Now, for you and I, this don't hit very hard because, you know, what's the big deal? But in the minds of the disciples, they are probably thinking, okay, for, G for Jesus, the last three years now, we've been walking around town running from the law because you know jesus is a bit of a bandit he's someone who's you know unhoused we talked about mary and martha last week staying at mary and martha's compound getting in the way of the authorities interrupting the economics of his day stifling the religious leader jesus is a quite a disruptive force and the disciples, these ragtag group of followers who, some of them were zealots. A zealot was literally the most revolutionary Jewish political group of its day. They were following Jesus because they ready for a revolution. Do you want a revolution? They like, whoo, whoo. I'm ready for it, Jesus. This revolution gonna be televised. You tell, point me in the right direction. I'm ready to kill up some soldiers. I'm ready to overthrow Caesar and overthrow Pontius Pilate. I'm ready, Jesus. I'm just waiting on you. Jesus like, okay, it's time to go through. Like, oh, all right, it's time to get cracking. And yet when they get there, the people looking to be saved a certain way still find Jesus to be a letdown. Jesus shows up to save us in ways we don't want to be saved. Because everybody's for a revolution until it's time for one. That's what I found out. <laughs> you know? Everybody want to overthrow something until it actually gets to the overthrowing. 
Like it's interesting, you know, to mean be you know overly political. Although there is some overlap here, that all the folks that showed up on January 6th, they was ready for a revolution. I mean, they they got so caught up in the thing that some of them would look at their own selves on video and not recognize themselves. Then when the consequences came, it was like, but it wasn't me. I was tricked. I was hoodwinked. It's bamboos and I was led astray. You're going to get these 18 months in prison. What? But they let me in. You scale in a wall with a, a hammer on your hip, breaking windows, talking about you got let in. No, that's not what happened. You was there for a revolution. And that revolution got televised. And now your fearless political leader, Donald Trump, as we go into Holy Week, he is on his way to jail. Now what's so fascinating about this whole thing is that there are people literally, some folk who claim to be Christians, I'm not gonna say where they are or they're not, but it's a fascinating thing, who are conflating Trump's week of horror with the Holy Week of Jesus. Right now in some churches all across the country, people are praying for their Messiah. <laughs> because that's how they want to be saved. They want to be saved by a strong man authoritarian, glad to use violence and harm and force to create a world that is built around their comfort. But you have this Jesus who has holy authenticity, who was being pushed to be something he was not, and with all of the encouragement, because you got to remember, Jesus going into Jerusalem was a political act. <clears throat> you know, we who are, you know, overly Christianized by this story. Read this is Jesus is going into Jerusalem and it's a happy, exciting time. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. You know, oh, he's coming to save the sins of the world. That's not in the story. That's in your our retelling of the story from the other side. But you got to appreciate that Jesus surely was being tempted to not be his authentic self. Jesus was being invited to be something he was not called by God to be by a crowd of people who had been looking for salvation in another kind of way. I want you to appreciate that your authenticity in the face of the external threats to our humanity must tap into the same holy authenticity that Jesus was able to maintain as he carried the fate of eternity on his shoulders. Because while you and I may not need to carry that weight, you must carry a sense of holy authenticity. That God has placed us in this world today to not get swept up in the project of someone else's hegemonic or exclusive or violent way of being. Jesus had such clarity that it did not dissolve into ambiguity in the face of other people's confusion. At the height of his ministry, Jesus understood that my kingdom is not of this world. And yet, my kingdom will disrupt the kingdom of this world. My way of life will disrupt any way of life that depends on the oppression and subjugation of others. 
Jesus being fully authentic meant that when he showed up, oppressors felt uncomfortable. And that's why Jesus ended up on a cross. <laughs> Jesus ended up on a cross because, you know, he loved everybody and they loved him back. <laughs> I want you to understand what I'm saying. You don't crucify lovers. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, in, in the public space. You know, there's a movie talked about a thin love between, thin line between love and hate. I'm not talking about your relationship. I'm talking about people <laughs> in the public space are rarely crucified for just loving everybody well. Unless your love disrupts the social conditions that have become addicted to hatred and violence and injustice and dare I say sin. In the words of Smokey, sin is sin. Sin. You see, it is important to keep reminding ourselves that Jesus' authenticity was connected to Jesus' consciousness of who he was required to be. If he was going to be faithful to who God called him to be. And all through this passage, one of the most important questions that was asked and is being asked is still requiring our response. In verse number 10, the scripture says, who is this? Now, I want you to think about how provocative of a question this is. Jesus had spent three years answering this question. I'm sure some of these folk who in this crowd, I'm sure the Pharisees and Sadducees, the people who were a bit miffed by Jesus, I'm sure the Romans, I'm sure everybody had heard about Jesus by this time. This man, he heals the sick, he raises the dead, he walks on water, he feeds folk with two fishes and some loaves. This guy, he's wandering around the whole region preaching in in on mountains with thousands of folk and still in his final days people are still asking who is this it makes me comfortable after a life long journey of following jesus to continue to invite myself to answer this question who is this who is jesus why is jesus here and for what purpose has Jesus shown up in my life? In this text, different people had different responses based off of their experience with Jesus. The disciples described Jesus in this text as Lord. The people who are inviting and worshiping him describe him as the son of David. Again, a deeply messianic Jewish designation. When Jesus enters into the temple and starts putting folk out. <laughs> they don't describe Jesus as anything, but they certainly, the scripture says, got angry at him. <laughs> Depending on your experience with Jesus in this story, Jesus was many things to many different people. And my question to you today is, whose report will you believe when it comes to this question being asked in your life? Have you had enough experiences with Jesus? Not with Pastor Mike, not with the way, not with Western Christianity, not with your mama and them's church. We entered in the Holy Week and I want to ask you, have you had enough experiences with Jesus where you can describe him in a way that is wholly authentic? 
Because the holy authenticity of Jesus is salvific. It creates the conditions for salvation. But if you only know Jesus is somebody who needs to borrow your car here and there. That sounds like a very transactional relationship with someone who has the power to literally, radically redeem your whole life. If you only know Jesus as a political leader, well, that, that, that could do some good. But Jesus is more than just trying to mess with your politics. And it, Jesus will, though, if you're serious about Jesus. Jesus is not going to let you be a warmonger and you following an holy, authentic Jesus. Jesus is not going to let you be an imperialist. You know what an imperialist is, right? Where you go across the world and like set up military bases and bomb people with drones <laughs> and hire, you know, mercenaries to go overthrow governments. Jesus is not going to let you follow him and you just be comfortable with that either you are not following a holy, authentic Jesus. You may be following a Jesus in your own image. And how many of you know that I want to argue that the people on Palm Sunday may not have fully appreciated who Jesus was any more than Jesus fully appreciated who he was when he was a child? My question to you is, when will our faith grow up and we can appreciate the authentic Jesus, a Jesus who comes to save your soul and your body, who comes to redeem your community and the world, who comes to ensure that you don't have to die in order to experience heaven, a Jesus who created the earth for good stewardship, not for exploitation. When will you and I come to acknowledge that we all have a choice to be a part of a crowd? We can be a part of the crowd that celebrates Jesus' arrival, or we can be a part of the crowd as the religious leaders were when Jesus showed up in the temple and started to kick folk out because they were exploiting the poor in the temple, them folk was upset. Two crowds in the same day having an experience with one Jesus had very different responses. I want you to believe in your heart, child of God, that as Jesus shows up in our lives, as we move into Holy Week, we will have a daily opportunity to join a crowd. We will have a daily opportunity to lay our, as the scripture says, cloaks on the ground, cut branches from the trees, welcome with enthusiasm a savior who is authentically showing up to redeem everything. Or we could be a part of a crowd who literally is so in the way that when Jesus shows up, you get upset. <laughs> and I believe that it is not a given which crowd we are in, the church in America. I hope we at the way we're part of a crowd that is happy when Jesus shows up. But I don't want to assume that all of us are happy when Jesus shows up. Some of us may be in the way. How do you know you're in the way? I'm about to close. I don't know if I'm a hoop on this close. But this is how you know you in the way. Verse number 14. The blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple and he cured them. Why is that so powerful? Because 
They could not get access to Jesus until Jesus moved people out of the way. Jesus in the temple. Guess what the temple was supposed to be for? You know, your religious practices, but also folks would come and, you know, get there. Particularly those who needed help. The temple was supposed to be almost like their welfare system, their place to get mercy ministries. <laughs> and the religious people had set up a system in the temple that literally did not have space for the blind and the lame to come to the temple and get what they needed. Jesus had to clear them out the way in order for the folks who needed Jesus to get access to Jesus. How do you know you in the way? Mm. If hurting people can't get access to your Jesus, you may be in the way. Did not Jesus say, I did not come to those who are already well. I came to those who are sick. People who don't think they are sick may be in the way of those who know they need Jesus. I and we can get enough education and money that we can forget how sick we are and think Jesus is for somebody else and hold on to a, as the scripture says, form of godliness but denies the power, the impact, the salvific work of God. I want us to enter in a holy week conscious that Jesus came to save us, not them over there, not the drug addict, not the gangbanger, not the terrorist, not all the nomenclature that always absolves you of being in need of a savior. Well, I'm just here because it's a good cultural thing. That's great, it is. I'm here because I need community, got a network. That's great, it is. Here's so my kids can be raised in a safe, that, all that's good, but guess what? I'm here because I need to be saved. I need a radical transformation. I need to make paths for Jesus to enter my life. Dare I say, Holy Week is Jesus' journey to Calvary. This week may Holy Week be Jesus' pathway to your most difficult places. May Holy Week be a place where you begin to think very differently about the disruption of the authenticity of Jesus. That Jesus comes to radically disrupt however you think your normal routine should go, even with all your normalcy, there's room for a holy, authentic disruption from Jesus. And again, I'm not talking about, as we say, the pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyed, Michelangelo looking Jesus with a bad perm. I'm talking about a Jesus who literally, when Jesus shows up, creates dissonance, creates some discomfort, and also creates the conditions for resurrection. The great gift of Jesus coming is that Jesus does not need death in order to create life in us. But Jesus is willing to go to all the lengths needed. The, I'm, 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 I'm closing, I promise. The, the, the early patristic father says that Christ became human so that 
we as humans can become like Christ. The scriptural reference is Jesus was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Why? So Jesus could be our great advocate, our great intercessor, dare I say our great healer. As low as you could imagine, Jesus went there plus some. Why? So there will never be a level of depression or exclusion or rejection or, 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 or doubt that you could be wallowing in that Jesus has not gone beyond. We sing an old song. It says, to the utmost. Jesus saves. You know, good old black church people, they would always have a remix on a real simple song. <laughs> so they put a G in front of that and say, to the guttermost. So it's like, you can be in the gutter, you can be in the utmost. Everywhere in between there, Jesus saves. He had to go through the trial to get to resurrection. Why? Because Jesus knows you're going through a trial. But the promise of resurrection for you is just as significant as the reality of Jesus' journey to resurrection. We enter in a holy week this week, fully cognizant that Easter is on the way. But you can't get to Easter without going to the cross. So can we go together? This week, can we enter into Holy Week with a clear connection to the path that must be traveled? It is not a path to cause you to feel like you have to become a martyr or walk around with the weight of the world. It is a path, I mean, the whole purpose of Lent, the whole purpose of these practices is to cause us to be in Fellowship. The scripture says to share in the fellowship of his suffering. I'm going to invite our Eucharistic team, the communion team to come because this is going to be one of the first ways that we share in the fellowship of the suffering of Jesus. The scripture says that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And he broke it and he blessed it. And he said that this bread is my body that has been broken for you. For as often as you eat this bread, you are doing so in remembrance of me. He took the cup filled with wine and he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the new covenant I make with you in my blood. For as often as you drink this, you are doing so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Communion, Eucharist, celebration on a Palm Sunday to me has a double impact. Literally, can you transport yourself sitting around a table with Jesus in the last days of his life when he is realizing that I've come to the end of my journey. I fulfilled my earthly ministry and now it's time to put a capstone event called crucifixion and resurrection into the equation. And Jesus brings an intimate group of his followers into a room with him to hopefully do a recap of his journey and to remind them that now you are being invited to share in my journey. May our time of being reminded of this great holy offering of Jesus, may we willingly step into the fellowship of the sufferings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may we say, God, I have decided to make you my choice. 
I don't know how others would describe you, Jesus, but I am willing to say you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Stretch your right hand forward, everybody.